would you uh, explain in the next paragraph of at page 4 the last paragraph of your written representations you uh, say likewise with actors in the information disinformation space often these people who are willing to help or be co-opted with sometimes little or no reimbursement, one expert, and they go over the page, from a Western European country told the present author, that's yourself, that disinformation in his country was carried out by not more than 10 individuals with pronounced right-wing sympathies living in Moscow. So this phenomena can be created by a very small number of uh, people with determination and skill. Exactly, and by the host or the aggressor country minister, not necessarily using that much by way of resources or it's expending that much uh, funds to, for, to, to do it, just co-opting within the country itself, the target country, individuals who feel some sympathy for its, for its cause. Right. Then the next paragraph, you refer to the Chinese internet army, I think, uh, it's self-explanatory. Can we go to page six of your written representations, the middle paragraph, the last few lines, starting with one difficulty. One difficulty with this is that kinetic armed warfare deterrence can be effective as actors involved are prepared to display their force. However, in the disinformation space, as well as more generally in cyber, Deterrence may not be effective as state actors are not prepared to show the arsenal of tools they have at their disposal. Concomitantly, the actors involved do not show what their red lines are, where the threshold that might invite retaliation has been breached. Would you explain that? Minister, if I may, I'll take a leaf from the cyber issue, which we also follow by way of comparison. They have from time to time been high-level expert groups, either academics or, in the cyber case, the UN Group of Governmental Experts, the GGE, which attempted to come to some sort of understandings, rules of the road, what the red lines are, what you can and cannot do in terms of cyber conflicts. The UN attempt suffered a serious reverse. People are sensitive about it. They deny it's a reverse. In my view, it's a reverse uh, in the middle of last year. Torpedoed, in my view, by the, the big powers who very much considered the status quo as being a good state of play to have. Status quo meaning no rules of the road. Now, if we take that Sorry, thinking... Can I just clarify? In your view, therefore, any there is very little likelihood that countries of the world will come together and have an agreement or a code of conduct, right, on this? It, on the cyber and the adjunct issue, disinformation, extremely unlikely. Right. In fact, if I might add, for disinformation, fake news, even more unlikely because the people who know cyber very, very well from time to time talk about a stage, let's say in 20, 30 years, where you have cyber strategic weapons of such potency that they have the capability to bring down a nation state itself. Right. But that's cyber, that's malware, that's cyber attacks. For disinformation subversion, the discussion hasn't even progressed to anywhere near that level. The reason I'm asking the question, I'm sorry to interrupt, is that one or two of the representatives, I think, have put forward the fond hope that Singapore and others should try and create an international alliance to bring about uh, norms and uh, binding agreements. But I think your answer is quite clear. I don't want to sound too dismissive, Minister. For right. example, for Singapore's ASEAN chairmanship, there's certain right. cyber knowledge sharing, capability yes. building know-how we could and perhaps even should right. do. But that's difficult as it is, it's too difficult in my view to say that norms can be built, certainly within the foreseeable future. Right. Let alone binding agreements. That will not happen in my view, Minister. Right. I interrupted you. Please carry on. No, that, that was my point. Right. So norms, extremely difficult for cyber, nearly impossible for disinformation, subversion, because the tools are too sensitive, too secret. You want to keep them to yourself. And anyway, it is uh, particularly in the context of asymmetric warfare, if Singapore is in conventional terms in a strong position, why would others want to agree with us to give up something that might give them an advantage? Exactly, Minister. Yeah. Page 7. 
starting with the paragraph at the top, you, now you talk about implications and recommendations for Singapore. You say any nation operating on a democratic model with regular elections and an open internet regime, regime should be watching carefully the techniques and tactics tried by powers that have tried to influence and undermine society in countries such as the United States and Europe. But beyond this, what is urgently required is serious study of the particular effect that organized disinformation campaigns can have on states that are polyglot and multiracial, and which are also data-rich states that aim to be smart nation. That sort of is a precise descriptor of Singapore, isn't it? Yes, Minister. These would be tempting targets. An aggressor could attempt to peel off one particular ethnic group or religion using social media and disinformation to appeal, as the case may be, to deeply ingrained historical cultural issues, setting off one group against others or even against the government. Singapore can be a sandbox for subversion. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Is there anything you want to add to that? Minister, I don't want to cast allegations to as again or to be a, a fear mongerer, but in my view, it would be a mistake to assume that this is not already happening in Singapore. These are advanced persistent threats. You deploy them long in advance before you actually need to use them. Yes. Now, uh, one side point. You talk about Russia using these point, uh, using these techniques developing them, you talk about China, but uh, frankly, any l large country, including the United States, countries in Europe, that take their defense, and here offense and defense is tied intricately, you would assume that they would have studied and they would have started developing their own abilities, yes. both offense and defense. Yes, Minister. For, and, for it to work, it has to be active measures in the other. Yes. Yeah. And uh, likewise, while we cannot put a finger to it, given the availability of these techniques, private consultants for hire, uh, not all of whom would be as flashy as Mr. Sepulveda, smaller countries, much smaller countries, much less resources, uh, particularly when they feel that c their conventional capabilities don't match another country, will be very seriously looking at these techniques and uh, information warfare. Yes, Minister. That is something that we must take seriously. Yes, Minister. Thank you. Now, you say in the next pa paragraph, if we can have that, uh, page seven, second paragraph. It should be observed, too, that countermeasures against disinformation should not be concerned solely with threats emanating from afar. There is evidence that some of these techniques are being used in some of Singapore's near neighbors. Data-driven political consultancies appear to have been engaged by political parties as well as individual candidates in the coming Malaysian general election. This will build up the expertise and capabilities within the region. Right? Yes, Minister. And um, the techniques would have been tried for a quote-unquote local environment. Yes, Minister. And it has the, if I may add, potential to leak out later because the tools are developed. Yes. It can leak out to the hands of less savoury characters, which is actually what happened in the case of Cambridge Analytica, initially developed by academics. Right. Um, methods and techniques used by, by others as well. So it can easily go out to many other people in the region who can have their own reasons for, say, attacking Singapore. Yes, Minister. And in the next paragraph, you refer to the Indonesian examples, Sarakan and uh, Ahok, and even the President, which you have uh, already referred to. Unless you have anything to add to what you said earlier, we can no, skip. Yes, Thank Minister. you. And then you suggest various... Uh, ways in which we need to try and deal with this issue, and uh, we understand that. But I think what we can say is the nature, particularly the evolving nature of the threat, 
and uh, the seriousness appeared to be such that I suppose all that even you as an expert can say at this point in time is we have to try all of these with no certainty that any particular method would it will in fact be the silver bullet Agreed, or a minister. set of silver bullets. Agreed, Minister, we have to try. Yes. Uh, finally, I think uh, your in the last page, you have uh, referred to the national newspapers. I think um, if you t the Straits Times and Lenny Chapao, I can show you some figures taken from the annual report mm. in terms of their circulation. They are holding steady, in fact, I think doing quite well. These are public figures, and because they are a public company, you know, it's audited. If you see the uh, combined figures between 2015 and 2017, they have actually shown a marginal increase. The com print figures are coming down. That's the nature of consumption. But the online figures appear to be going up. Now, precisely how long people spend and uh, what sort of consumption, I'm not an expert. I'm, I'm just taking these figures off the top line. But I think uh, the point that we both <coughs> probably can agree on, all of us can agree on, is that you need good uh, newspapers which people can trust. But again, that's not going to be the silver bullet. It's got to be one of a series of solutions. If you had a good newspaper, that alone is not going to help. You've got other things to do too. Mm. right? But I think if you look at the standing of uh, the newspapers, the main English and Chinese newspapers, their overall uh, circulation seems to be holding steady. And if you look at comparative uh, sort of studies on trust in them, we seem to be doing much better than many other countries. Uh, that's just a point for you to, uh, for me to just put to you. Okay. But I think we both agree on the broader point that we are going to need a whole series of measures. Would you agree with that? Yes, Minister. I agree. Right. Now, um, you then, I think it's a point we have anticipated, but uh, if you look at that uh, last paragraph of your statement, even as governments clam down on fake news through legislation, fact-checking websites and NGOs that put out correctives, the actors behind fake news appear to be calibrating their methods. And in the last few lines, you say, as one commentator observes, it is easy to manufacture a lie, relatively cheap to distribute it widely. To demolish that lie takes intensive effort, and meanwhile, the nature of the internet ensures that it, meaning the lie, lives, breeds, and reinforces other lies. Would you want to explain that a little bit? Yes, Minister. If, if I may be permitted to <coughs> excuse me, take a leaf from the study of violent extremism, which my think tank also does, Singapore has had different waves of the terrorism threat, the JI threat, more latterly online self-radicalized. As you have pointed out within the last few days, Minister, the online self-radicalized are particularly tough nut to, to crack. The success rate in counselling rehabilitation for those who got their ideas online, maybe groomed by IS people online, WhatsApp, Telegram, it's much more difficult. Now, of course, disinformation is a different issue from terrorism. But at the same time, there are certain conceptual similarities similarities in terms of echo chambers, filter bubbles. Some of the IS, ISIS fanboys are so happy, they seem to inhabit this world where 
everyone's agreeing with them. People on the left, the right, separate chambers are tuck theories, deviationists, you bump them off. They are, they are fit targets. Something similar is happening in the fake news disinformation space worldwide. Again, to go back to the terrorism space, Singapore has a good track record at de-radicalization, rehabilitation. However, I've seen people, many people, radicalized online, worldwide. I've seen very, very few people de-radicalized online. It's possible to de-radicalize people. I've never seen it wholly done online. Not to say it can't be done. But whenever I've seen it done, not just Singapore, but worldwide, there must be some active human agency involved together with any online countermeasures you try. I believe that to be the case for the fake news disinformation space as well. And I think that's useful because I believe many submissions, including mine, have called for fake news fact checkers, online better, more robust counter narratives to be put out. But I think that's useful for our thinking that we are going to grow up in 20, 30 years with a digital generation which has only ever known digital, as the Straits Times figures, which were surfaced just now, showed. Circulation is, in fact, very healthy if one includes digital. Yes. But I, I wonder whether, if you look deeper at the issue, that brings with it risk as well. Ideas come into your head, you foment, you think, you get worked up, ideas go out. Absolutely. So I, I think this is going to be a big problem. And I wonder whether we need more real-world interventions. I believe I mentioned, for example, the SG, SG conversation five, six years ago had nothing to do with these issues. But it was good to get different people, Singaporeans. I don't know you. I don't agree with you. You leave feeling I still don't agree. At the same time, this person's a Singaporean. I've been forced in the room to rationalize, to have discourse with him. Whatever we do eventually to fix the so-called fake news disinformation problem, we certainly, in my view, have to have some level of real-world intervention. I cannot agree more. I think, uh, the, if I may just share with you a little bit of the evidence that was given yesterday, the problem seems to have these sort of different uh, aspects, and I'm not intending to be comprehensive. The intentions of the attackers are quite clear. If they are foreign state actors, that is to undermine your sovereignty, your will to fight, to win the war, even without having to shoot a bullet, if possible, but otherwise as relatively light kinetic operation as possible, because they weakened you and divided you. And we are a sandbox because we have the inbuilt potential for being divided along racial lines, along religious lines, along uh, sort of nationalistic lines. Many countries do, but we are a small place and much easier to exploit. So the intention and the will is there on the part of many people, both external and internal, in the sense that internally there can be people who do this for profit, for other motives. The technology is there. It has been tried successfully, with varying degrees of success, but it has been tried successfully in Europe, in US, in other places. We face this, and the fact that conventional, in conventional military terms we are in a superior position also makes us a target for others. And if you put all of this together, one of the key techniques is to actually divide our society. To reduce, to destroy trust between communities and between communities and the government and also institutions. We had the churches and the Buddhist association here. People also want to destroy, uh, the wood attackers also want to destroy people's faith in institutions, including religious institutions. So, and they want to flood them with disinformation to such an extent that you no longer know what is true and what is false and you become cynical and you prefer to be in your filter bubbles and echo chambers. The antidote to these very powerful forces have to be, uh, I think, uh, you know, looking at the challenge and the problems, and I would say this just based on the evidence so far, what has been suggested uh, should be is, you know, you do fact-checking, though everybody understands that 
the fact, truth limbs very far behind the lie and perversely reinforces a lie for most people based on you know, some evidence of the way the human brain works. It, truth doesn't really convince many people who want to believe in certain things. And a lot of people are polarized and want to believe in certain things. But you have to have fact checking. Preferably organically within the society itself. Second, I think you are going to need extensive public education, but that's going to take time. Third, you need to build even more actively the bonding within community. And I think the kind of conversations you talked about, where people feel part of the country and feel valued and feel that they have a stake and they want to do something for the country and for themselves, and by sticking together, we all benefit. That kind of uh, feeling has got to be encouraged. And that's not going to be done by some rules or regulations or laws or diktat or online. You have to have state agencies do that. Uh, and uh, you probably need a kind of legal framework to make clear you know, whatever you have in the physical world, whatever is outlawed in the physical world is outlawed in the online space, and also to target the specific threats and reduce the virality and the speed and, if necessary, take down obvious falsehoods. How that is to be done, you know, it's got to be thought through. But these were some of the suggestions that were made yesterday. Mm. And uh, I think one thing that has come through is you're going to need active intervention by human agencies, government as well as non-government. You're going to need... Uh, clear conceptual framework. And yet, with all that, I think no one is in a position to say that it will definitely succeed. Because the attackers are also evolving their threats. But, you know, that's the sort of perspective on the evidence yesterday. Thank you. Yeah. So we accept fully uh, your point. I mean, I'm not saying I accept for the purposes of the initial eventual recommendation. But I accept fully what you mean by human agency. I can only speak for myself. The other members have, might have their own views. But I can't see how this can be done without the intervention of human agency. So thank you, Dr. Jayakumar.